again and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd. We're glad you could join us for another hour of answering your gardening questions. Our phone panel is standing by to take your questions. Dial 402-472-1212 if you live in Lincoln. Our toll-free number is 800-676-5446. If you'd like to send us an email or pictures for a future show, that address is byf at unl.edu. Attach those pictures as JPEGs. Give us as much information as you can, including where you live. And we'd also like to hear from you on our social media sites. Those are Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Pinterest. So, Jody, you brought in a beautiful green insect. Yeah, so I brought a katydid. Um, this one's actually called a, a greater angle wing. Uh, I don't know if anyone can see it. I'll put it up like this. Oops. Oh. <laughs> But it is um, a leaf mimic. It can be, it has been called a longhorn grasshopper or a bush cricket, but all of those insects, crickets, grasshoppers, and katydids are all in the same uh, order. They're in orthoptera. Uh, they're my least favorite order, by the way. So I don't love all things. I just <laughs> moderately like this. Um, but it, it's a leaf mimic. It looks like a leaf. Um, these guys have these enlarged like hind legs, and then as adults, they have wings. So if you see one, it looks similar, but doesn't have wings. It's just not an adult. Um, so they are pretty camouflaged. They live in the vegetation. They feed on the vegetation. Um, but I found this one because they make noise. So the males, uh, they do a thing called stridulation. And that's uh, when they rub their wings together. There's a file and a scraper. And that's how they call for mates. And so I, with my headlamp in the middle of the night, uh, went and I found this one on, on my pollinator habitat and uh, to bring it in. So if you're interested in the sounds that they make, there is. Um, I think it's like Songs of Insects website, and you can like go to sleep listening to crickets. If you want, uh, a fun fact about these is that they've got their ears actually on their front legs, on their mm. tibia, and also when they're mating, they offer the female a nuptial gift, which is a nutritional gift along with sperm. Oh, for heaven's <laughs> sakes. Insects are so interesting. <laughs> okay, Matt, you look like you're ready to take on the uh, world yes. with... I got a few different chemicals here. Um, basically, what I wanted to talk about was we're getting closer to that fall window to control broadleaf weeds. And there's a couple different ways you can do it. A lot of people use fertilizers uh, with the carrier as a chemical, and they're using them. A uh, pretty easy method. You're fertilizing and controlling controlling the weeds with like a, a weed weed and feed product. Uh, here's another option that you have is these are basically hose applicator ones. So you're not actually mixing the product. You're getting these with the product in them. You're hooking up a hose and you're spraying them. Uh, so one way you want to do that is basically you got to read the instructions. Um, they do state how much you use per thousand square feet or how much they treat. This is a few of them that I saw and they do control different weeds. So uh, if I start here on my left, or my, my right, um, Liquid Turf Builder by Scott's here, this one has actually, it's just a weed and feed. Uh, so it has some fertilizer in it, and it also has a 240 Mecaprop and another ingredient that basically controls only broadleaf weeds. So if you're looking for broadleaf weed control and a little bit of uh, nutrition, this is a product that works well. Um, Looking to the next one, I think I say this uh, pretty much every episode. This one actually has trichopyr in it. So if you're looking for an ingredient, um, when I say that one, actually, this one has it. And it's the only ingredient in there. And it's for some of those tougher to control weeds. Um, so it has it listed right on here, oxalis clover. Um, and I think ground ivy would probably be listed in this one too. Um, one thing you want to make sure is you're not applying too close to the tree roots or around trees with these. Uh, once again, read the label, make sure you're using it right, but uh, there are options for uh, controlling some of those tougher broadleaves. And then the last one here uh, is just a Roundup product, and it actually is not Roundup that's going to kill your grass. It's Roundup for lawns, so it actually doesn't have any glyphosate in it. So you want to make sure you're reading the labels correctly and you're not grabbing the wrong one and applying it all over your lawn. But this one actually has crabgrass control too. Um, these other lines do carry a product that has crabgrass control too. And the only difference in there is that it has quinclorac in it. And that one is the active that does pretty well on a lot of the grassy weeds, foxtail, um, crabgrass. 
And also sulfentrazone, there's another product, and that one is for yellow nuts edge. So if you see that one in there, that one actually helps with yellow nuts edge control. So make sure you read the labels, and with these, yes, you're hooking them up to the hose, and you always want to apply them from the front to back, that way you're not walking through your chemical. So it basically is to wet the leaf surface. You're not soaking them, you're just wetting the leaf surface. And you move backwards and you want to do it in an even pattern, so there's, there's a little bit of you know, practice to get good at it, but uh, it's a pretty good way to control weeds. All right, thank you, Matt. Yep. Okay, fortunately our audience cannot smell what you brought. Kyle. And luckily I'm too stuffed up to smell much anyway. So <laughs> I have a, a few things, and so first thing I wanted to, uh, wanted to show is I have this twig, and this is a twig from a, from a nectar plum, um, which is a cross between a nectarine and a plum, but it has this gamosis, or the kind of this, this oozing sap that's coming out, and, and there's a little bit of a canker right here. And this is actually a canker for the, uh, for the disease brown rot, which is pretty, pretty common on a lot of stone fruits. And you can even kind of see there's some of that, some water soaking um, here as well, where it really just looks like this, this branch has been, has been laid in water, and so it's just a little bit wet. And this gamosis is pretty typical, or this oozing is pretty typical of, of brown rot. Now, there are some other diseases that can cause this oozing, these oozing cankers as well. Fire blight would be one of them. But then we want to go and look at the fruit. And so the other thing that I have is one of the nectar plums that I had pulled off of it. And this is a mummy, or it will soon be a, become a mummified fruit. And if you can look, uh, get close, and just oh, there's all these bumps on here, and I'll kind of rub my finger against it, and then we can maybe show my finger, but these are all the spores for next year. And so when I, whenever we talk about controlling brown rot, we really talk about controlling the mummies and making sure that we're picking a lot of that mummified fruit, because all of these bumps that are full of spores, they're gonna cause infection next year. And so not only do you want to remove the mummies, but if you are seeing some, um, some cankers like this, you'll want to make sure that you're going down and pruning these cankers out as well. As far as um, uh, chemical control, there are a few fungicides that work for, um, for brown rot. The most important times to control um, or will be kind of right in that pre-blossom stage and then also in the, the few weeks right before the fruit starting to ripen. So right now is a little bit too late to do anything, but if you do have a history of this and you've done your pruning, then you can think about um, an application of maybe lime sulfur um, during the, during the pre-bloom stage, and then maybe come back with another fungicide such as thiophanate methyl um, later to protect the actual, the actual fruit. Excellent, and yes, that is our nectar plum in our backyard farmer garden. Yes, and I will not be mm -hmm. eating this. Just it <laughs> off in your water. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Jeff, what did you bring tonight? I brought in a couple things tonight. So the first thing I'll talk about is um, I brought in a branch off of a Cornelian cherry dogwood. And every year, uh, usually in the spring, I'll bring in uh, some things that are flowering, and that's one of our earliest flowering trees or shrubs. Uh, and it's reliably hardy as far as the blooms are every year. And so we're able to bring this in. I'm able to bring it in just to demonstrate the fruit that I have on it. Um, so it's full of fruit this year. It's, it's, it's an edible berry. You know, without sugar, it's not real tasty. So it's not something that you're going to want to chew on. I mean, I eat them, but you know, most people probably wouldn't want to eat them. But um, uh, but they make an excellent jam or syrup. It's, it's something that, that's typically native to Turkey, uh, Eastern Europe, and so they use it there for a variety of things that we might use blueberries for or something. So, But it's fun. It's super hardy, produces a ton of fruit. I'm getting, you know, I think last night my wife and I picked uh, 30 pounds off of one tree, so one shrub, so, and I have nine of them, so we got a lot. <laughs> So the other thing I wanted to bring in real quick is uh, this limelight hydrangea. Um, it's, again, it's a, a great hydrangea for our area, does very well. One of the secrets with hydrangeas that uh, sometimes we forget because they do well in our climate is that they need steady moisture. So if we're not getting, and this year's been pretty good with uh, our temperatures and the amount of rain we've received, but um, still I've continued to supplement uh, this particular plant with a watering at least once a week. Uh, I have some Annabelle 
I do the same with those. Oak Leaf is another one that I'll do that with. Uh, without that, they'll continue to grow and, and they may flower, but not to this level. So, you know, you got, you got, and it's not a lot of effort, so it's not like I'm out there doing a lot to it. But it takes a hard pruning every spring, and then um, I end up with 60 or 70 of these flowers, you know, this time of year. So it's a fun plant to have. It's pretty awesome. Wow. All right, yeah, nice so job. our first round of picture questions, cut rather quickly. Uh, you have multiple IDs. Your first one is Big Beautiful Moth. They were sad that it was dead. What was it? So that's an imperial moth. I've never seen one, so that's pretty neat. I think like eastern, southeastern Nebraska is like the farthest, like west and north it might be. Nice, too bad it's dead. <laughs> then we have one that is from Sunrise Beach, Missouri. No one knows what this was. Okay, so that is a moth that is called, it could be called the royal moth or, or wait, the regal moth or the royal walnut moth. But it's, um, it's larvae is pretty famous. It's caterpillar is called the hickory horned devil. Oh. It's, yeah, it's crazy looking. It's got these um, like spines on the head that are red. It's not devil and it's totally fine. You can hold it. Okay. Your third one here is another butterfly moth. We've had this one before. Yeah, it's so, a good picture. Right, so we call these skippers. This one's probably the most famous skipper. We've got a lot of these around here. The silver spotted skipper because of that white spot. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And the fourth one is a little creature in the butterfly weed. Yeah, that's beautiful. We get a lot of those at the backyard farmer garden. So this is a common buckeye um, butterfly, same type of family as, you know, painted ladies and whatnot, but really pretty. Their larvae, um, their caterpillars feed on snapdragon. Oh, perfect. Awesome. Beautiful, beautiful. All right, not so beautiful for you, Matt. Dang. <laughs> <laughs> and these are trees for the turf guy. There we go. Uh, for pretty good reason, probably. They noticed some browning and drying of the needles on the lower branches. This is a mead. Um, and they're adjacent to a sod farm and cropland. So they're wondering what happened. They said last year it, this happened to one blue spruce and they had to cut it down. They've got 50 trees. What do we think this might be? Yeah, it's, I mean, it does, it could definitely be some sort of damage from a herbicide applied earlier in the year. Mm -hmm. um, it depends on, I mean, obviously what was sprayed and how close it is or what the direction of the wind was that day. Uh, but if it's all the trees in the whole row and it's that bottom layer, there is a good chance that it could be uh, something that would have drifted into it, uh, not sprayed probably directly on it, but drifted in. So it depends on how bad it is. It looked like in that picture, there's actually some needles growing in uh, behind those brown ones or still, still alive. So the trees will probably be okay. If you were to get a heavier shot and it starts moving up the tree, then you know that you're probably gonna have to remove that tree like you did your others. So maybe talking with the adjacent owners, uh, just nicely talking with them and <laughs> seeing if they can uh, be careful when they're spraying and make sure the wind's correct so it doesn't kill the windbreak. All right, excellent, thanks Matt. This is a really interesting one. This is, um, this is done this, this squash thing they turn lumpy and yeah. green, and the zucchini turn lumpy and green. They start out fine. Then she's calling them Franken squash. Yeah, they're they're beautiful. <laughs> I, she's I think tried so. everything. I mean, different seed manufacturers. She rotates her crops. This is Ida Grove, Iowa. Okay, um, so this is actually a virus. Uh, looks to like squash mosaic virus, and there are a few different mosaic viruses that the squash can get, but they will all all of them will kind of cause this this fruit defor deformation as well. And then I'm guessing the leaves are probably a little bit mottled, so kind of a dark and light green color kind of speckled throughout. But um, these, this, uh, this virus is actually, it's spread, um, it is spread through seed, but if you are switching up your seed varieties and um, different producers, then it's most likely um, there is a, some sort of weedy host in the area as well. And so this virus is, is uh, vectored by a cucumber beetle and so I would recommend getting rid of all of the other, um, all the other weedy hosts in the area. So if there's any wild cucumber um, or cockaburs or anything like that, try to get rid of those. Um, other thing that you can do is you can, you can apply an insecticide to try to control that vector. However, um, squash, mu squash mosaic virus doesn't really affect the fruit. So if you're fine eating lumpy, interesting <laughs> fruit, 
I'd say go ahead and have it. You can have a new party favor. Oh my goodness. <laughs> or they can peel them. Or they can throw, or, yeah, yeah. Let's, right. Let's I mean, if they want to. Yeah, yeah, right. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> okay, Jeff, this is an Imperial viewer. Uh, they have a Hackberry they think is 1970s, looked leafed out, looked fine, then started dropping leaves, and then it's got all this odd curling. So she sent a couple, three pictures, no spraying, she thinks. So she had, they don't see any brooms, they don't see any insects. She put a five gallon bucket of humus acid around it and watered it in. Okay, right. Well, you know, uh, hackberries don't have a lot of pests. So they, that's what's nice about them and that's why they do so well throughout the state of Nebraska is that um, they don't suffer from a lot of insects. There's a psyllid that'll do a little gall on the leaf that isn't really a problem. Um, but other than that, they don't suffer from much. And thracnose may be one of those things that it may suffer from. Uh, so if the conditions were right in the spring, they may have started that. And then part of it could be just uh, a declining tree. It's maybe have gotten to that point where the root system is just not able to sustain the tree. So right. I would wait to see the spring, how it leaves out. All right, thank you, Jeff. <clears throat> Well, you know, one of the most important features of any home is your outdoor living space. Sometimes the house is a dream, but the landscape itself needs a little loving care. One young couple in Lincoln has taken some major steps in renovating their backyard. Um, when we moved in five years ago, we just had a deck and uh, just some grass. And there was a pond behind our garage which wasn't full of water, but the structure was there. When we first moved in, it was just kind of a mess. Um, so it was all grass. It wasn't really taken care of very well. It was a rental before we moved in. Um, there was a pond in the back here that was just kind of knee deep mud. So we, we pulled that out. Most of the grass was, was under quite a bit of shade. So it didn't really grow very well. So we, we took the grass out and just put down mulch just to to have something here and, and not have to deal with the grass anymore. Um, we started making changes because we both wanted um, some gardenscapes, um, be able to have like a vegetable garden, uh, food that we could enjoy, some bees perhaps, um, just a nicer looking backyard besides just grass since it was a sloped backyard, the grass wasn't too great. It's been a little bit every year, so like we built the garden um, with just one step the first time. It was two slopes, so we built in a second step progressed to getting bees, and then eventually um, put in like a mulch scape since the grass just really wasn't continuing to grow at all, and it was mostly weeds at that point. Um, as far as building a, a raised bed garden, um, we started off our first year with just one sloped raised bed, and it didn't really work so well. It basically, it just all the water from the rain just washed the whole thing away. So we ended up putting in two terraces just to to keep things in place. We have two beehives back here. Uh, we're hoping to go for three next year. Um, they're, they're fun, but they're also a challenge. Um, being in Lincoln, there's quite a few backyard beehives and that can be a problem. So the issue comes up that not all of them are perfectly taken care of. And there's quite a bit of problem in Lincoln with mites being transferred from one hive to the other. So you really have to keep on top of that. But otherwise, there's a lot from the forage on. So anybody that's looking to um, redo like a new landscape or an existing landscape, and you're not exactly sure what you wanna do or how something's gonna you know, actually grow in your yard, I would take it step by step. Uh, just because like with our raised bed, we thought maybe just one step would be okay if we built the, the more sloped end up a little bit higher and it wasn't so then you know we had to adjust that and you're not always sure if a plant is really going to do well in certain spots depending on like the sun the shade and if you take down a tree one year that's going to affect like your plant community so I, I recommend taking it slow because then you know your, your ideas might change too You know, that's a great idea in the landscape. Take it slow, do not be afraid of change because it's inevitable. And here we are with pictures again, Jody. Your first one here is a butterfly garden and she found this on the cone flowers. She thinks it's a worm or a centipede. What is it and what should she do about it? So 
that would be not an insect picture, I think we just saw <laughs> up there. That's a tree. Yeah, so that was a tree and it's an unknown bug for this one and there it oh, is. Oh, okay. There it is. This is the common pug caterpillar. Pug. It's called a pug. Like not, that. yeah, they're, <laughs> no. But yeah, they're, they come in so many different colors, actually. This one's bright yellow because it usually reflects the color of the petals that they're eating. They usually don't do enough damage to warrant any control, but they all have this, they're, they're inchworms, so they walk that funny looper way, and then they've got these little arrows or chevron type things on the top. Very cool. All right, and then you have one that simply says slug. Okay. So I'm an entomologist. I don't study slugs, but I did look <laughs> no. into this because it's pretty cool. It's yeah. like a really long slug. Um, this is a, a leopard slug um, or a spotted garden slug, whatever you want to call it, but it's a type of mollusk and, you know, slugs, same kind of conditions, decaying organic matter, moisture. Mm -hmm. Very and, cool. And the entomologist always gets the slug questions, just so you know. And your third one here is an insect on sweet corn, and this is in Cozad. Okay, so this is, uh, it's called a, a bumble flower beetle. So it's a beetle, it's a scarab, so similar to a Japanese beetle, but uh, they feed on like sap and decaying organic like fruit. So they do feed on corn. Um, if there's like a crack or anything in there, it usually doesn't need any control but it's a beetle and it's called a bumble flower beetle because it sounds like a bumblebee. Perfect and interesting. All right, Matt, you have a couple here that are weeds and right. one that I think <laughs> we're scratching our heads on. The first one here is in Gothenburg and it's a couple pictures of something that has a tiny little flower. Yeah, it's, it's uh, something that I do not know what it is. It's, it's in the Asteraceae family is what we're thinking. I was asking Kim and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, fair and seen. I, I don't know exactly what it is. So we maybe need a sample of that yes. into the North Platte office or because something the close. the flowers on it are yeah. so minute. They're yeah. just those five little white dots on them. I I cannot ID what exactly it is. You might need it maybe another picture when it's a little bit more mature, but it just doesn't look like anything around the area. Well, and sometimes that happens. I know it is. Sorry, I couldn't help that one. And then this is an Omaha viewer who is worried that uh, this, which I think we have one picture here, is poison hemlock. It is not poison hemlock. It is prostrate vervain. And that one is an annual weed also. And you want to make sure that you're getting rid of those because they're going to be seeding out here this time of year. Uh, they're an annual, so they're going to spread a lot of seed. And they usually have little purple flowers that come out the tops. And then obviously they're gonna lay a bunch of seed down for the next year. So make sure you rogue those out or mow them if it's a big area. Really herbicide is getting a little late because they're too big uh, and they'll set seed before you can get rid of them. All right, thank you, Matt. That will be good for her to know. Yep. That's not poison hemlock. All right, it's um, maple time. Okay. <laughs> and this first one, let's see. We do not know where this person is from, but they've noticed black on the leaves of three of the maple trees and a picture of the whole tree and then one's very black, the leaves are curling. What do you think this one is first, Kyle? Um, it's kind of hard to hard to tell with um, just based on the picture, but one of the things that could be is it could be anthracnose. Um, it does look like a lot of those black dots are kind of associated with the, with the veins. And especially if the leaves are starting to curl, that that often is a often is a sign of anthracnose. But there are quite a few other fungal leaf spots that that maples can get. Uh, Tubacchia is one of them. Tar spot would be another. But tar spots typically forms a lot larger lesions than than this. As far as control. You know, this time of year, I typically don't recommend doing a whole lot to leaf spots. Um, however, if the trees are really young, you may want to pr be really be protecting that foliage. So maybe some sort of copper application would be effective in this case. All right, and your next one is, we don't know where this one is either, but first off, you see the trunk. And then second, you see the top from the picture from her. And yeah. What is that one? This looks like a case of a little bit too much water this year. Um, the uh, the discoloration along the along the trunk is pretty indicative of of some of our root rot, such as Phytophthora, and especially if the entire really the entire tree is declining like this, turning yellow, the leaves are kind of burning around the margin. Pretty sure sign that there's something more serious going on down in the root system. Now, if it dries out 
we may not have that much of an issue. So this would, I really take, just take the wait and see approach and see how well it leaves out next year. All right, and that trunk thing, right? Yeah. Yes. I yeah, it's just too deep. Yeah, so that was too I'm, deep. I would guess yeah. that, yeah. you know, the risk system is compromised, compromised. at this age. Right. Yeah. Okay, so you have a tree question also, Jeff. Okay. This is, uh, these people have an aspen. This is in Blair. Okay. And they're wondering if the small plants growing next to this one are also aspens because the leaves are so much bigger. I think they sent us a couple different pictures of this one. And yeah, the aspens tend to want to make a colony. Um, and so the upside is if you'd like to have a colony of aspens, you might end up with one. Uh, if you don't want to have a colony of aspens, then you will have to, on a regular basis, go in and prune those off. You can mow them off. It'll take a, you know, it's not, doesn't happen all the time. And, uh, but I have a couple different aspens at home, but we have them on campus. And they do require some maintenance, and that's just part of it. It so. is. And no such thing as no management of any plant. Right, right. All right. So, yeah, a little bit of pruning occasionally, and you'll keep it under control. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Well, you know, you know, earlier in the season, some of our marigolds were just too delicious for Jody's Japanese beetles to resist, <laughs> but they've come back really well. Terry James shows us a couple of marigolds that are All-America selections in the Backyard Farmer Garden. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we're going to continue with our All-America selection winners for 2019. It's interesting because two marigolds actually won the outstanding national award for flowers. One is the big duck. We've talked about that one. That one's just a little bit uh, over 12 inches tall, does really well. And the other one is Garuda. That is the big tall, two foot tall one that the Japanese beetles have been crawling all over all summer long. So their head isn't quite as strong. The big duck actually says by the judges that the seed head stays really well and it lasts really long in the garden. They're both that yellow orange marigold traditional color that we always think of, big heads. Stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check out our two Marigold winners for All America Selection this year, Big Duck and Garuda. Those flowers were absolutely smothered by Japanese beetles a few short weeks ago, and we're so happy now that those beetles have done their due diligence and flown away, unfortunately, for everybody else. Then we will start the lightning round and see who wins. Okay. You ready, Jeff? Yes. All right. Pin oaks are yellowing, and this particular viewer used fertilizer on them. Is the timing on that correct? No, shouldn't be fertilizing this time of year. That's, and you probably should have them looked at in the spring by an arborist. All right, uh, this is a Gibbon viewer who wants to know whether he should trim the leaves off the lower Brussels sprouts stalks <clears throat> to encourage the sprouts. I don't, at this stage, if they're not sprouting, I think I would move on to something else, think about something else for your fall garden. But if they're not flowering, then I don't think I would, I think they, we probably aren't gonna have much this year. All right, will strawberries in pots overwinter in the garage or outside? In pots, they may. Uh, I would leave them out as long as you possibly can uh, and let them go fully dormant and then bring them in and then you're gonna have to maintain some moisture as you go through the winter, but it's, it's worth trying. All right, when is corn ripe? When is corn ripe? Um, well, I, I think depending on when you planted it. So you'd have to know your, your planting intervals and then you would be able to harvest based on that. All right, uh, pine needles are, are being shed. How long does that last? That'll last, depending on the pine, throughout the fall. So, you know, right now we'll see a little bit, but you may see some in the spring as well, depending on the pine. All right, nice job. Not very lightning-y, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, are you ready, Kyle? Always. So we have a person who wonders whether they should rogue out their peonies with botrytis or treat them. Um, you can, I would just do some pruning to take care of the, the botrytis then to allow some more airflow through there and that should take care of the botrytis. All right, uh, we have a viewer who had aster yellows and they tore out the plants. They wanna know, can they replant plants in the same soil? Um, I would plant a different plant in the soil. Most likely you left some of the root system in the soil and that can harbor the, the, um, the aster yellows. 
All right. Uh, we have a viewer who says he has a giant mushroom in a hollow trunk of a maple and is wondering, is it a fungus and will it hurt the tree? It's a fungus. It's most likely feeding on the tree. It's a sign that it's a problem tree. Um, start thinking about something else. All right. Um, a viewer has spots on crab apple and apple leaves right now. What to do now? Um, I wouldn't do a whole lot. A lot of the, a lot of the um, con chemical controls need to be done earlier in the spring. All right, this is Beatrice Viewer who says, when do they treat to avoid rotten peaches? It all depends on what's causing the rot. Perfect. Read the label. It depends. <laughs> Read Mother Nature's six. label. <laughs> all right, are you ready? Yes. Okay, this is a Raymond Viewer who wants to know when to apply a pre-emergent with fertilizer. In the spring or no. in the fall? No. Now? No, <laughs> now is fall, I would Matt. guess sometime Early to mid September would be targeting some of those fall broadleaf, annual broadleaves. Excellent. All right, this is a Humboldt viewer who says everything is green. Should they go ahead and put down the fall fertilizer anyway? Um, you could hold off right now and wait at least until late September if everything's looking pretty good. All right. What can dandelions and violets be spot sprayed with to avoid using that three way product? To avoid using. Any chemical, 2,4-D. You could just use a straight product, 2,4-D, and the fall works well, not in the spring. All right, excellent. This is a broken bow viewer who wants to know, they say they can't aerate before the seeding window closes, so will it hurt to aerate over the newly seeded turf? No, you're not affecting that much of the area, so you're basically just not really affecting the new seeding. All right. Uh, grass be gone. Will it eliminate grass in wildflowers? This is a Syracuse viewer. Yes, and it should not hurt your wildflowers. All right, nice job. Ready, Jody? Okay. <laughs> I haven't won at all, all season. Here's your chance. There's my okay, chance. so this is an Omaha viewer who says sap is dropping from his pin oak. Is that honeydew and what to do? It is honeydew. There's not a whole lot you can do. Okay. With the sap sucking insects up there. Okay, how do you treat for ants and rhubarb? Um, there may be something sweet there that you'd want to wash off. All right, there's a tiny little yellow spider that a viewer in Murray saw. What might that be? Well, there are a lot of spiders, but I do know um, there's a lot of crab spiders on the flowers. Mm -hmm. If they've got like, I'm not gonna do any motion. <laughs> Big claw. You already did. Have? <laughs> it could be a crab spider. All right, what are the large giant black things falling out of the ash trees? Oh, the galls? Yeah, it's just, it's just a gall. All right, this is a Raymond viewer who wants to know whether a serious bagworm infestation will kill his cedars. Over time it will. All right, and this is a Hickman viewer who says they have bagworms on the very top of their spruce. What can they do about Get it? Get a ladder, a strong, trustworthy friend to hold that ladder and some uh, grabbers. Perfect. Pick those off. Perfect. And look at what happened there. Winner, winner. <laughs> All I'll right. present this Put to it. Jody. Thank you. That's Perfect. Next year. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jeff, what are the plants of the week? We have two uh, interesting plants this week. So the grass we see here is uh, redhead fountain grass. Uh, so it gets pretty big. It's three to four feet tall, three, four feet across. Uh, likes a lot of sun. So like all our grasses, you're going to want this in a sunny, sunny spot. And then the, the broadleaf herbaceous plant here is a uh, China purple bush clematis. So also four to five feet across, uh, likes port shade, um, will handle drought, fragrant, and any plant that handles drought will probably seed itself. So, mm -hmm. uh, so that's something, so it may be a good thing. Yes. Sometimes I like plants that seed themselves, so. And those are both in the backyard farmer garden and it's not a vicious reseeder yet, of course, but yeah. So a purple theme tonight. Purple, K-State. <laughs> yeah, not, no, not. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we have picture questions next. Jody, this is a viewer who has oaks and he sent us a couple of different pictures and two or three people have sent us pictures of this. Whole tree showing kind of this browning sort of, not uniform, and then the mm -hmm. close-up picture I think of the foliage gives a little bit yeah. better idea. And after last week when we had a question about that, I started looking up a lot and there are a lot of oak trees that have these brown clumps of 
looks like brown oak leaves. And so that's the twig, oak twig girdler. And so it's a, it's a beetle. We don't usually see it, but it, it pretty much eats from the outside in along these twigs that are about the, like the diameter of a pencil. And then they lay eggs in the twig that's gonna fall on the ground. And then they develop in there. The, and so what you wanna do is rake those up and destroy those leaves and twigs because they overwinter. Um, in those twigs, so. All right, destroy, don't compost. Yeah, and if you can reach them, yeah. I mean, you can um, prune them out, but they are gonna fall eventually and continue the life cycle, so that's All what right. those are. Okay, thanks, Jody. All right, you have two or three different IDs here this time, Matt. Uh, the first is Lake of the Ozarks. Mm -hmm. Wonder if it's quack grass, and if it is, will tenacity kill it? Yeah, it's, it's definitely not quack grass. Uh, what I was looking at by this picture, if, as far as I can tell, it looks more like orchard grass, and that's a perennial. Uh, and really, uh, tenacity will probably not work for that either. Uh, so you're going to have to actually spot treat it with a non-selective herbicide, and then uh, that's one of the ways. Or dig it out, because it's pretty much just a center uh, tiller there. All right. And this is a Columbus viewer who has this grass, in quotes. He says it, it looks like it's scattered throughout his yard. What is this one? Yes, and this just looks like tall fescue. So if you have a bluegrass lawn and you have clumps of this, it's most likely uh, what you're seeing, tall fescue scattered throughout the lawn, and it will form a clump. All right, and your third one is actually yours because it says the word lawn and has a lawnmower in yeah, it, but it's it orange dust. Orange dust, nope, don't know what that is. No, it's, it's rust. <laughs> right. And this, this time of year, going into the fall, uh, we've had really high humidity the last couple, couple weeks, actually. And when the, weather's, or the weather cools down a little bit at night and the grass is growing slow, let's say it needs a little fertilizer or it's dry, that rust will form and then you have rust on your lawnmower, your shoes and everything. But generally, don't need a, a fungicide or any type of control. It'll naturally go away. A little bit more water and fertilizer usually helps. All right, and don't leave the Good lawnmower answer. in the Good lawn answer. or else <laughs> then you've got rust from the lawnmower. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> All right, so you have different pictures okay. since you got the rust picture, Kyle. This yeah. one is from Crawford County, Iowa. Ooh. And this is leaves on the acorn squash. The fruit is fine. Um, what is this? It's and is there something they should do? Our old friend, powdery mildew. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit too, a little bit too moist in that area. So anything that you can do to, in, um, to in, increase the drying period on the leaves. So avoid the overhead irrigation. If you need to do a little bit, a bit of pruning, you can. The other thing, um, if you would really want to, there are some horticultural oils that work as a um, kind of as a curative, but they're not 100% effective. All right, and this is a actually a Lincoln viewer, white powder leaves on the peony, and the reason you've got this picture is because that peony is under that tree. And peonies really probably shouldn't be under that full shade um, because then we'll get powdery mildew. Again, anything that we can do to increase the, um, the drying period of those leaves will decrease the powdery mildew. All right, in other words, move the peony. Move the peony. <laughs> okay, so you have another corn question here, Jeff, okay. but this one comes with a picture. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and um, she says, what causes this? One whole row of her corn was like this. The stalks are short, it's tough, and it's not very sweet. Well, I, she just had poor pollination, and so that can be caused by a variety of things. I mean, it can be too wet and too cool when it was pollinating. It could be too hot and too dry. Um, so... You know, there's a variety of things that can cause that. All right. Uh, and your next one might have gone to Dennis, but he's not here. And this is a beet question. Yeah. 95% 90, of her crop is wow. like this. Yeah, that's really interesting because I've grown beets forever and I have them now and I haven't experienced this. To me, it looks like vole damage. Right. Um, so anyway, I, I would look and see voles have those characteristic little runners in amongst the plants. So if you have that and they're easily trapped with live traps, real, they're, they're easy. Put a little oatmeal in a live trap and they'll run right in. Perfect, and if you wanna see one of those runs, go look in our garden right now. Okay. <laughs> Unfortunately. You know, our annual fair show is coming up next week and when you go to the fair to see us, you might expect to see a few other things you've never seen before, like giant pumpkins. At last year's fair, Nebraska Extension plant pathologist Tamara Jackson-Zims and her husband Larry decided to try their hands at growing these behemoths. And here they are to tell us some fun facts about how they did it. Larry and 
I became interested in growing pumpkins and in particular, Larry had always been interested in growing one of these giant pumpkins that everyone sees on TV. And so one year I, I purchased some of the special seed for him for his birthday. And now uh, we're in our second year now of growing giant pumpkins. So we're still pretty new at this. One of our biggest goals is just to grow the biggest pumpkins we can, but our main goal is to try to take one or more pumpkins to one of the one of the local way-offs, a sanctioned way-off by the Great Pumpkin Commonwealth, so we can we can show and tell with other giant pumpkin growers. And so last year our first pumpkin weighed in at 807 pounds. Well, Larry and I live on a corn and soybean farm here in northern Nebraska, but I want to tell people that you don't need a farm to grow giant pumpkins. And so many of our most successful giant pumpkin growers actually are able to grow them in their backyards. They may only have space for one or two plants, but that may be all you need. Uh, some of these growers can grow these pumpkins over a thousand pounds with as little as 300 or 500 square feet. And so you just need to fertilize and water frequently. One of the other things that we do is we pull off all the other pumpkins so they don't compete with the weight gain of our giant one. And so it, it can be laborious, but you get a lot out of it because you uh, can weigh, or you can't weigh them during the season, but you can estimate the weight during the season by measuring it in three different directions. And there's charts to help you estimate the weight and they grow really quickly. Ours you know, are only growing 12 or 15 pounds a day right now, but some of the 2000 pound pumpkins put on 30 or 50 pounds a day. And so that's what's what we're, we're shooting for. We certainly found out last year and this year, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. A lot of it you can't do anything about. Uh, extreme weather that we have here in Nebraska can be pretty tough on pumpkins. Of course, hail and uh, very high temperatures or very low temperatures. We also, uh, we have a lot of stress due to wildlife. And so deer, woodchucks, gophers, a lot of those things are challenges for us. But I wanna encourage anyone who thinks this sounds like fun to go out and learn more about growing giant pumpkins. There's a lot of resources available to you online. Several uh, websites are out there. One of the main ones I would check out is go learn more about the Great Pumpkin Commonwealth. You might also check out bigpumpkins.com and uh, many of the other YouTube videos from some of the other growers. This gr giant pumpkin community is very open. They love to share some of their secrets and I would encourage anybody to check it out and try it for themselves. What a fun project. And Tamara said you can't make pie or mini pies out of those giants, but they really are something to see. Nancy, and we don't have a whole lot of time left, so I think we're going to go ahead and go to announcements first, especially since at least one of those is about us, because we, of course, are going to be at the State Fair. We actually have somebody who sent in a question asking about when we're going to be at the State Fair, and that is they've, they've moved Older Americans Day to Monday. And so we will be uh, at, at, uh, on, on location at the fair, Q&A at 2.30 to 3.30. We tape from 4 to 5 in the Raising Nebraska building. And as Nancy and I were talking, having that live audience always puts us on our game. Our Grow Row produce donations are still going on Tuesdays, 5 to 7 p.m. in the Backyard Farmer Garden right here on East Campus. And we love to see all that produce come in. And then, of course, our totals always kind of grow a little bit, as they should. Backyard Farmer Garden is almost 890 pounds this year, and Grow a Row is at about 150. So we're getting right up there toward half a ton of produce in, in a season where it's kind of hard to grow things. So that's fabulous. We also have one final one, and this is the 2019 Forest Festival Family Fun Night. Don't say that fast. <laughs> with the Nebraska Forest Service Friday, September 13th, 5 to 10 p.m. at Horning State Farm at, near Plattsmouth. And I have heard that that is really going to be a lot of fun, a lot of activities going on on that one. All right, so we have some picture questions still if we want to go ahead and, and uh, try to get a few of those in before the very end of our show. Um, your first one here, let's see, this is a Central Omaha viewer, Jody, and they want to know what is on their annual hibiscus. She's planted one every year for many years. She's never seen it. She says the flowers still bloom, but the buds are covered. Okay, and I was talking to some master gardeners today, and white flies are a mm. huge problem with these annual hibiscus. If you are planning to bring it in for overwintering, you're going to want to treat with a systemic in the pot so it doesn't infest all your other things that are going to be in there. 
All right, excellent. And your second one here is, what is this insect? She's in Fremont. She sees one or two of these little things in the bathroom sink. Okay, so these are springtails. I get uh, lots of these every week. Um, it's just, it's a moisture pest. No insecticide needed. You just need to dry out the area, dehumidifier, uh, like a fan. Nothing else. It's moisture. All right, excellent. All right, you have a couple more uh, weed pictures, Matt. All right. Uh, the first one, actually, uh, we had two two people from different places send us this picture, and um, they want to know what this is and what to do about it. <clears throat> yeah, they look really neat, but they are actually, it's teasel, or I think this one is cut leaf teasel, has the white flowers, and it's actually, since 2014, I think they consider it a noxious weed, because mm -hmm. it can spread pretty rapidly, and so you do, no, do not want to let it go to seed, I guess, because it'll spread and cover your whole area. So it's actually illegal to keep it if you Oh, it is. It. Oh, yeah, that's all. Well, then get rid of it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and your second one, we've had several uh, several pictures uh, from viewers this year about this one. They want to know what this is. Yeah, these are fun. You just take them and you pop them. They're ground cherries, uh, or Virginia ground cherry. And uh, so, yeah, they're uh, actually a perennial weed. They'll spread by seed and also underneath the ground in rhizomes. So it's just get get rid of them. Chop them out. Uh, when they're young, it's easier to take care of them with most broadleaf herbicides. And if you look at the, the way they, you know, the, the, the cherry itself is in that little papery husk. Yep. And, you know, they're, they're not something to be consumed. Oh, so yes, you don't yeah. want to eat them either. Don't no. Want no. No. I did not know that. No. I always just no. popped them when I was a kid and they were well, so fun you to were, play you with. Were, you, were actually, you were actually <laughs> raised Plant well. Your, your mother said, don't put it in your mouth unless somebody tells you can, right, if you're That's in the right. garden. Yep. Yeah, and Chinese lanterns, of course, have that, the, mm -hmm. the orange ones are, are the same, are the same uh, you know, the same yep. genus on cool. that one that are beautiful.